Hello, Seattle. All right, cool. Um, OK, quick poll. How many people are comfortable with category theory? OK, a few hands. How many people are comfortable with Haskell but not comfortable with Scala? All right, a couple. What about the other way around? A lot more. OK. OK, so yeah, I'll, I'll do like a little Scala, a little Haskell maybe, and, uh, and, and a bunch of category theory. All right, let's get started. So this is just going to be on the whiteboard. This is totally unprepared and extemporaneous, so bear with me here. So we're going to talk about categories. Um, OK, so uh, <clears throat> the API of function composition, or the, the sort of programming model of functions, is as, as follows. So let's say we have a function, and I think this is going to be doesn't matter if we use Haskell or Scala here. So let's say we have a function that goes from some type A to some other type B. All right. Then we have another function G that goes from some, that that same type B to some other type C. All right. Then we always have a function uh, G compose F. Wow, I'm actually mixing Scala and Haskell here now. Uh, so in, ha in Haskell, compose is just dot. So we have a G compose F, which goes from A to C. All right. So that's that's the sort of uh, API of function composition. Uh, but this has to this, this obeys some interesting properties, and those properties are that um, well, the implementation of, of this is uh, you know if we have some X. Then we do f of, no, sorry, g of f of x. g of f of x. That's the implementation of function composition, composition of g and f. Um, <clears throat> so this obeys a property that um, if we have three functions, let's say uh, f, g, and h, and we compose them together like this, uh, that's always going to be you know, f of g of h of, uh, of x, like this. Um, lambda of x. And so it doesn't matter whether we consider the composition of f and g first or the composition of g and h first when we're talking about how these, uh, these functions compose. Okay, so, um, and then there is also for, for every type, there's an identity on that type. So we have an identity, identity function uh, on, a, on any type A. This is now sort of quasi scala notation. Uh, and that goes from the type A to A, and that's the, the function that always returns its argument. Okay? So far, so good? Cool. Like, uh, let's not jump to, to the abstract. So this is the, the sort of concrete um, API of, of functions in, in Scala and Haskell. Cool. So let's now jump to the abstract. Um, we have, in general, a category. Uh, so we have a, a category whenever we have some things that we're going to call objects. And we have some things that we're going to call arrows. And the arrows are going to compose um, <clears throat> that is, the objects are going to be things like, you know, A, B, C, whatever. And arrows are going to be called things like f, g, h, and whatever. And they're going to compose in such a way that whenever we have an arrow f that goes from the object a to the object b, uh, we're going to have and an arrow that goes g that goes from b to the object c. It's supposed to be a b. Then we have a composite arrow, uh, g compose f, that goes from a 
to the object C. All right, so arrows compose. And, there, for, and for every object, there's going to be an identity on that object. So there's going to be an identity on every object A, and that's going to go from A to A. All right? So you can view a category as a sort of like, the objects are sort of points in a space or something, and then there are like arrows between them somehow. And then we can consider whenever we have an arrow like this and an arrow like that, we have a composite arrow like that, and here as well, like that. And then everything has an, uh, an identity arrow. And the, what the identity arrow means is that whenever we compose the identity with anything else, the, the, the rule is that identity composed with F is F, which is the same as F composed with the identity. That is, the identity arrow doesn't do anything. Same as over here. Um, the identity function doesn't do anything, and it is a, a unit or an identity for function composition. So uh, Haskell or Scala or whatever, uh, function composition forms a, a category like this. Where the objects are types, uh, the arrows are functions, and composition on the arrows is function composition, and the identity arrow is the identity function. Okay. So that's the category of functions and types. So that's where you sort of start. And this here is category theory. This is all of category theory right here. All right? Uh, and, and so, I mean, there's a lot more to explore, and everything follows from this, sort of, this definition. So this is the theory of categories. Okay, cool. Um, let's talk about some other categories. All right. This is, this is super high tech right here. Um, okay. So Scala forms another kind of category where <clears throat> the objects uh, in that category are types, again. Uh, and the arrows are going to be subtype relationships. So let's, we can call this category Scala bleh, like that. It's like, a, it's like Kermit the Frog or something. What? Does it have its own name? Uh, it's it's the uh, it's subtype, so I guess we could call it Scala sub, or something. Uh, it's a, it's actually uh, the uh, poset of Scala, so it's consider considered as a partial order on the types. So okay, so we're we're gonna go through this. So notice that the arrows now in this category are not functions. They're not even like functions. So the, the, the category is constructed as follows. Uh, whenever we have uh, a type A, uh, and uh, that type is a subtype of another type B, this is an arrow in this category. So we have an arrow in this category from A to B. So this is an arrow between A and B, I mean from A to B. We have one exactly when we have a, a subtype relationship like this. And every type is a subtype of itself. So that's the identity. And the composition on the arrows is the sort of transitivity of the subtype relationship. And the uh, associativity of, of composition is that it doesn't matter whether we consider, if we want to say here that so A is a subtype of C because, well, A is a subtype of B and B is a subtype of C. But we could also say, well, B is a subtype of C and A is a subtype of B, right? We could reason either way, and it doesn't matter which we consider first. 
So that's the, that's the associativity. Uh, and you know, and obviously this uh, this does doesn't do anything interesting. Like if A is receptive of B and A is receptive of A, then this doesn't imply any, anything extra. Cool. So this is a, this is an awesome category. Note that in this category there is at most one arrow between any two objects. It could be zero. Like for instance, uh, there's no arrow uh, from uh, like there's no arrow between uh, any and uh, and well any other type except any. Right, so any is not a subtype of any other type. So like, so there's at most one arrow uh, between any two types in this category. Cool. <clears throat> uh, let's do another one like this, but in a different setting. Um, in general, uh, we have a, a category like this whenever we have a partial order like this. So we have a category. We're going to call that a Ho set uh, category, or let's call it a poset, considered as a category. Um, <clears throat> so given a poset, given a poset, which is a, a partial order, that is, it's a, a set uh, with you know, an order. Like uh, we have uh, the, the set is some elements, you know, x, y, and and z, and whatever, and then we have some kind of partial order relationship so that we can compare, you know, two objects in this, uh, two elements in this set. And so that's what's going on here. We can so so um, some types are are bigger than others, in this sense. Uh, and another example of this is just like oh the the natural numbers. Uh, for instance, the natural numbers are a category just like this, where uh, the objects uh, are, you know, numbers. And then there's an arrow uh, between the number A and the number B exactly when A is less than or equal to B. So a question? That's an excellent point. So uh, the question is, in the first two examples, the objects were sets. They were multi-valued things. But now I'm moving to something where the objects are like a single-valued thing. Yeah. Uh, so we could consider uh, a partial order set like this. We could consider it as the power set uh, of, of a given set, and then consider the subsets of the uh, you know, we can for, we can take any set and we can construct the power set of that set, and then we can consider subsets uh, of of each other and consider that as a category. And that's the kind of category we have here, right? So this is sort of like the power set of all uh, Scala objects. Okay, great. <clears throat> so this, um, but here, the objects are numbers. And then the arrow, there's an arrow from any number A to a number B whenever A is less than or equal to B. Uh, and then every number A is less than or equal to itself. That's just uh, always the case. And so this category works exactly uh, like this one. And so whenever we have a partial order on some set, we have a category exactly like this. In fact, we can say that uh, a partially ordered set or a poset is a category uh, with uh, at most one arrow between any two objects. So that's the definition of what a poset is in terms of category theory. Cool. Um, so there are lots of other examples of, of categories, uh, and I'm just going to go through a whole bunch. 
Uh, let's leave the definition of what a category is up. Um, maybe let's do like some really simple ones. Okay, so in order to construct a category, we need some objects, we need arrows, we need composition that needs to obey these sort of laws. All right, so here's a category. It is just a single point or a thing. It, it could be whatever, and it doesn't matter what it is. And this, so this category has one object, so we've satisfied that. And it has to have some arrows, and we're just going to say it has an identity arrow on this object. And that's all it has. OK? Uh, so that, that's an honest to goodness category. And we can compose the arrows. I mean, we can take the identity arrow as many times as we want. Like, we can just do the identity arrow over and over, and we end up at the same point. And this is still an honest to goodness category. It works because we've satisfied all of this stuff. Uh, this, is, this is called the category one. Uh, there's also a category two, which uh, has two objects. And there's an arrow from one to the other. And then, the, you know, there's an identity arrow on every object, like this. And we can compose these arrows to our heart's content. We can take this identity lots of times, and then take this arrow, and then take that identity lots of times. Uh, and that all still works. So. Little categories like this we can construct to our heart's content. You know, there's the three as well, where there's like an actual comp composite arrow like this. That one's called three. And there's even a zero that has no objects whatsoever. So, uh, yeah. So, so even, even when we have no objects, we've satisfied this. Like we have some, uh, we have like an, an empty set of objects. Uh, and, you know, we have no arrows, and so we satisfy that whenever we have two arrows, we can compose them uh, because, like, we don't have any. And, like, there's an identity arrow on every object in this category, on all zero of the objects. Okay? So, so those are just sort of little, uh, uh, little categories that we can do stuff with in category three. Oh, okay, let's, uh, let's do another programming one. Uh, a monoid, so here's a sort of a categorical definition. A monoid is a category with one object. Okay? So uh, we, can, we can talk about how many people are familiar with monoids? How many people are not familiar with monoids? Okay, just just the, like three or four. Um, cool. Okay, so so let's do a monoid in uh, Haskell or Scala. Uh, actually, I'm going to do it in Scala because because Julie needs to learn Scala. Uh, okay, so uh, so we can give a monoid uh, trait in Scala. So it's a, a type. So we have a monoid uh, for some type M. Given that we have a def, we have uh, it's called a zero, which is an, an object of type M, and we have a uh, let's call it an append operation, append, oh, and that takes. Uh, one M called A, another M called B, and the whole thing returns an M. Okay, so my node is given by by this uh, this sort of type, and uh, we have to supply uh, a binary operation that can combine two M's and a zero that is an identity element for this operation. Uh, so it has to be the case that this append is associative. Uh, so let's let's say, for example, uh, the uh, integers form a monoid like this, um, and so our append is going to be plus, and our zero is going to be zero, and then um, the rule is that 
uh, A plus B plus C uh, is the same thing as A uh, plus B plus C, like that. It doesn't matter which way we order, we uh, put the parentheses, it's associative. And then zero plus X is X, which is the same as X plus zero, right? So that's an identity element on this. So this is looking a lot like a, like the category stuff, right? It's, it's there's some stuff that we're composing. Uh, there's an, uh, an associativity thing and there's an identity, right? Uh, and there, there are lots of lots of monoids like booleans uh, with uh, or and true, uh, no sorry, or and false and 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 true. Uh, there are you know mul multiplication with one on on the integers and uh, strings with uh, string concatenation and the empty string. All of those form monoids. Okay, so how is how is this a category with one object? So here's how, how that works. Um, the object in our category is just some, some sort of anchor that we're going to attach all of our arrows to. And the arrows are the values of type M. So we have, uh, whenever we have a value of type M, we're going to have an arrow from this object to itself. So for instance, in the integers, we're going to have one arrow called 1. We're going to have another arrow called two, and then three, and negative four, et cetera. Lots of these arrows, as many arrows as there are integers. And then there's going to be one special one, which is the identity arrow, and that's going to be zero. Cool? <clears throat> and the composition of these arrows is going to be integer addition. So if we have the arrow one, and then we, comp we have the arrow two and we compose them, uh, we get a new arrow three. And so it's a, it's a little bit weird to think about like numbers as being arrows, it's like they're going somewhere, they're, they have a direction, but the direction is just the order in which we wrote this stuff. So uh, for instance, if we have string concatenation, then foo, plus bar, like that. If we add foo and bar, we're adding them in this order. The arrows go in that direction, which is not the same thing as saying bar plus foo. We get a different answer, okay? So, so the, the directionality of the, of the arrow tells us sort of uh, how, we're, how we're composing them. So, so there is definitely sort of a direction here. But it's kind of weird because they're not like function like things. Is there a question over here? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just taking the integers as an example of a monoid. Uh, so so the, yeah, this could be the, the set of strings with concatenation. Uh, this could be the Booleans. Uh, the Booleans would be, you know, a category like this with two arrows, where you can do true and you can do false, uh, and then co composition on those would be, uh, say, and, for instance. Um, and so there'd be two different categories, one for composition being and, another for composition being or, and the identity would be either true or false, depending on which one of those categories you're in. Yeah. Do you have another question? What's that? Oh, is there anything that I can say about the value of knowing that a monoid is a category of one object? Uh, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. It's just sort of like a unifier for, like a cognitive unifier. Like anything that you could say about categories, you can now say about monoids. Um, so, so that's pretty cool, because there's a lot of stuff you can say about categories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the stuff is... Uh, so all of category theory is essentially just a generalization of the, the properties of functions. And functions is like something we're super interested in. Is there a question over here? Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. So, so it's like, uh, this one looks special because you're like doing it first. Yeah, yeah, but the thing is that there could be more stuff over here, right? And you don't know, right? And, and the thing is that you shouldn't care 
whether you, and that's the associativity rule. Like you, you shouldn't care whether you do that or whether you do this. Like which way you can, which one you consider sort of first. Um, right. Cool. All right. So monoids. We did posets. Uh, what else can we do in terms of categories? Let me see. No. No. So the object in the category is just the dot. Uh, you can. Yeah. Oh, so in the case case of any monoid, it's a category with one object, and like the structure of that object does not exist. We could just erase this thing. The only thing that matters is the arrows. The object just serves as a sort of a point to anchor the arrows. That's sort of the directionality of the arrows. Yeah, OK. Sorry? Oh, products of monoids? Oh, yeah, yeah, OK. Yeah, we could talk about products and ways of combining categories. Um, let's see. OK. Well, uh, yeah, why don't we do that? Actually, let's talk about some things we can do with categories then. Yeah, so here's, here's the thing I want to talk about with categories. Um, the, uh, the notion of an isomorphism. OK, so when we're talking about functions, the notion of isomorphisms is that if we have a function f, it's an isomorphism whenever we have another, you know, if we have another function G, uh, and th that is its inverse, right? That that takes you back to where you started. So that would be the sort of the identity. Uh, <clears throat> and so that would be the notion of, uh, uh, I guess, a bijection. Is that is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, but but we can talk about this in general in categories. So we can actually say that in category theory, so, so this sort of the bijection thing is a, is a function notion. But in category theory, an isomorphism is just any arrow in any category which has an inverse in the sense that the composition of, of uh, the, the arrow and its inverse is the identity. Sorry? I, either way, yes, yes, and, and also that. They're, they are inverses of each other. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. OK, so this is a, this is a good point. So uh, yeah, part of what defines what a cat so which category we're in is what the composition is. So it's, it's the, the objects, the arrows, and the nature of the composition, uh, the, those things uh, define what the category is. Is that where you're getting at? Yeah, yeah, OK. Yeah. So it's not enough just to have objects and arrows. And then, like, oh, we have a bunch of composition things. No, it's like which composition you're talking about defines which category you're in. Yeah. So you you, you have one of them. Uh, was there another question? No. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so an isomorphism is one of these things uh, where we have uh, two arrows and they are inverses of each other in the sense that composing one with the other gives us the identity arrow. Um, and with uh, functions, it's kind of easy to think about. It's like you know, plus one and minus one or something. Uh, but we have this actually, uh, we can think about this in arbitrary categories. For instance, we could think about this in monoids. Um, so uh, for example, uh, let's say we have uh, a clock, all right? So you know we have 12 points on the clock here. This is probably not 12, but whatever. Uh, and so we can do sort of clock arithmetic, where like we have two 
plus six, uh, giving us you know eight. And then if we do uh, eight uh, plus six, you know we get back to two. All right, so it's a sort of a cyclic thing. Uh, so this is a modular modular arithmetic. So we um, uh, so we just have twelve numbers, and we can add them all together. Um, and we have a zero here in our monoid, which is twelve, which means that twelve added to any other number takes us back to that number. Right. So we go a full circle around the clock. We add 12 hours. Uh, so then we'll have uh, for every one of these uh, for, for every one of these uh, points on the clock, we will have uh, an inverse. That is, we'll have a way of getting to 12 from that number. So like six is its own inverse because we add six to get to 12, which is the identity. Or like you know. 11 is the inverse of 1, because 11 plus 1 is 12, which is the identity. Right? So we can talk about isomorphisms in term, in purely in terms of categories like this. Uh, and so we don't uh, need to sort of constrain ourselves to like bijective functions. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. What does isomorphism uh, apply to? So an isomorphism is uh, it's an on arrow that uh, has an inverse in the following sense. Yes. <laughs> Uh, such uh, such uh, a category is called a group. Yeah. Well, if it has one object. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there a question over here? The associativity rule. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so like the notion of like a left and right inverse thing. Uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that's an example of, of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have the, the notion in my head for some reason, so I guess it, yeah. Um, OK. So that's a, a, isomorphism, a, thing, a thought that we can think using only category theory. right? So we have given the definition of an isomorphism purely in terms of categories. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, an isomorphism on monoids. Let's talk about. Uh, actually, let's talk about. Let's talk about. Talk about. Let's talk about monoids again. Um, talk about. So not only is every monoid a category, there is a whole category of monoids. Category of monoids. All right. What are the objects in this category? They're monoids. Uh, and the arrows in this category are functions. But they're special kinds of functions. They are monoid morphisms or monoid homomorphisms. So they are functions that obey a certain law, uh, which is that uh, if we 
So let's take two, two monoids. We have, uh, let's say we have monoid M and monoid N. Um, and then we have a homomorphism that goes from M to N. Then it should obey the law that for any element in, uh, in here, I mean, for, for any, any two elements in here, X and Y, say, X and Y, if we do H of X and sort of uh, smash that together with H of Y, uh, we should get the same thing as if we do H of X smashed together with Y. Cool? <clears throat> so the, um, the monoidness of this is preserved across this, this mapping H. For example, let's say we have uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So this one is in M, and this one is in. Uh, sorry, sorry. This one is in M, and that one is in N. Yeah. That, that's exactly right. And so it should it should preserve this. Uh, uh, this, this relationship. For example, if we have uh, strings x and y, then the concatenation of the two strings x and y, and then let's take the size of that string, that should be the same as the uh, size of x plus the size of y. Right? So Taking the size of a string takes us from the string concatenation monoid into the integer addition monoid. And so now we are, uh, and, and this obeys this sort of homomorphism, that taking the size of a composite thing is the same as composing the sizes. Cool? Awesome. Um, great. Uh, and these compose just like regular functions. And, uh, and there's an identity on, on every monoid, which is just the identity function. Cool. Um, so not only do we have a category of monoids, but monoids are categories, right? So we actually can, can, can do this. We can come up with a category of categories. Which is kind of cool. What are the objects in that category? Well, they're the obvious thing, right? Objects are categories. And then the arrows uh, are going to be um, category homomorphisms in the, exact same, in the exact same way. Like, it's going to look exactly like the monoid thing, except uh, category homomorphisms are usually called functors. Functors. Um, and so we have, uh, whenever we have a category C and a category D, and there's sort of this mapping between them, we're going to call that F, uh, we have to uh, map the objects of C onto the objects of D, and the arrows in C onto the arrows of D. In, in a specific way, in a way that preserves a homomorphism law, that that is that f uh, of some composite arrow f compose g uh, is the same as f of f composed with f of g. Okay. So in uh, Haskell or Scala or whatever, uh, we're often interested in uh, functors between the Haskell category and itself, uh, or the Scala category and itself. So this is, let me just give that in Haskell. Uh, so we can have a class of things uh, that we're going to call functor, uh, given some functor. Uh, so, so we have a functor for the type constructor f. Uh, where 
we have a thing called fmap. Uh, or, you know, as I could just call it map. I mean, come on. Uh, where map uh, takes an arrow in the Haskell category, so an arrow, of, of, which is a function from A to B, and it turns it into uh, an arrow from F of A to F of B, which is also an arrow in the Haskell category. Cool? And so the homomorphism law says that mapping the composite arrow FG should get us the same result as mapping uh, F and composing that with mapping G. So uh, this could be useful. For instance, if uh, we're mapping over a list and like we have some kind of strict data structure, uh, it could be a lot faster to map over the thing once with two functions composed rather than mapping over it twice. Right? That might be cool. And so, th so uh, this law tells us that that's safe to do. And we can assume that that, that should work. Um, cool. Huh? Can I do Scala? Oh, yeah. Uh, so this becomes trait. Uh, and this becomes a square bracket. And this takes a square bracket with a little hole in it. And this becomes a squiggly air, uh, you know, bracket. And, and this becomes a colon. And this becomes a double arrow. And then, you know, this takes a square bracket as well. All right, now it's Scala, right? Oh, like that. Oh, sorry? Do we need a def? Yeah, def. Now it's Scala, ish. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, a a class in in Haskell is very much like a. I mean, it's like type classes. I don't know if you work with type classes in Scala very much, but like it's the same, the same kind of idea. It's like a a trait where you have an implicit instance of that trait somewhere in scope. Um, cool. So categories of categories, that is totally awesome. And you know what else? Oh, I didn't talk about the composition of functors. I guess that's kind of important. Uh, if we, whenever we have a functor f that goes from c to d, and we have a functor g that goes from d to uh, e, we have a, a composite functor, uh, which is g f that goes from c to d. So, so, huh? Oh, sorry, goes to e. So in the um, Haskell or Scala category, we can think of, for instance, having lists of maybes or something. And that is then an, an honest to goodness functor. And we can map over both structures at once. And, and this composition tells us that that, that works. Yeah, so composition of any two functors is also a functor. All right. Not only do we have category categories where the arrows are functors, given Given any category, given a category C, we have uh, a category of functors from C to C, which is kind of cool. Uh, so th these are called endo functors. Endo means within. So the objects in here uh, are functors, endo functors in C. So functors from C to itself. So if you want to anchor yourself to Scala or Haskell, these are like functors in like in the the trait uh, endo functors in that category. And the arrows, arrows, are functor homomorphisms. Right, so we can just kind of keep going like this. Uh, the, the the functor homomorphisms are called natural transformations. Natural transformations. 
And now I'm going to now I'm going to do Scala. So natural transformation in Scala, we can talk about uh, a natural transformation trait. Uh, let's call it squiggly arrow like this. And it goes from a functor f to a functor g like this. So given uh, def apply of some type A, so given some object in C, we can get an arrow. Uh, sorry, we can get, given an object in C, we can get an arrow from, yeah, let's call it F. This is F of A and G of A. Cool. Like that. So that's a natural transformation is gone. So we can go from F to G. So this is an arrow from the functor F to the functor G. Um, and I guess this has to, uh, this has to obey some homomorphism law, right? That like applying it to here should be the same as, uh, yeah, I guess so. So like if this is a functor, it has a map method on it, and so does so does that. So this is telling us that like, uh, you know, let's say we have something called H, and then so H of some X uh, map F, is that right? Something like that. Uh, that should be the same as. Uh, same as x map f, and then h applied to that. So that's a homomorphism law for the uh, for natural transformations. I think I think that's it. So it doesn't matter, uh, or it shouldn't matter whether whether we map f before we go across or whether we map f after we go across, because like we're just going to change whatever stuff is in here. And the natural transformation actually cannot talk about that stuff. It can only talk about the structure of, of F and taking that to the structure of G. And it can't look at the content. Cool? Oh, yeah, H is our natural transformation. Uh, you know, let's say we have uh, an H of a type like this. Uh, actually, H going from F squiggly arrow to G. So given that, uh, that should that should imply imply that. Cool. Uh, how much time do we have? Do we have time? Lots of time? Yeah, let's do more. All right. Why don't we do products? Yeah, actually, we can do maybe initial and terminal stuff. OK, let's do initial and terminal objects. So uh, let's say we have a category with a bunch of you know, objects in it or whatever. And then we have some arrows in that, in that category, like, you know, like, like that or whatever. Um, let's, say, let's say this is our category. <clears throat> then there might be, not necessarily, but there might be some object um, that has a unique arrow going out of it to every other object. Okay, uh, and we're, we, that is called an initial object. It's sort of the first object in the category. It's the initial object, and then there might be one that has a unique arrow coming into it from every uh, object, and that one would be called a terminal object in the category. For example, in the Scala uh, POSET, uh, the initial object is any 
Uh, no, wait, is that the other way around? It's nothing, because nothing is a subtype of everything. It's nothing, and the terminal object is any. Yeah. Um, so in, in a post set in, in general, the, the initial object would be some biggest thing, uh, sorry, some smallest thing, and uh, terminal object would be some, some biggest thing. Okay, cool. Let's do post sets, I mean, let's do uh, products. Okay, um, product. Uh, so I'm sure you know people are familiar with with uh, pairs in in Scala or Haskell. Yeah. So you've seen products of types like this, right? So uh, so this is a, a a product of the objects A and B in the Scala or Haskell category. Um, but we can talk about products in general in a category theory sense. Uh, so a product is uh, some object, we're going to call that P, in our category. So there's a, a product in some category C or whatever. Uh, it's going to have two uh, arrows coming out of it, two projections, uh, one of them going uh, to A and the other one going to uh, some, some other object B. Um, and this is going to be a sort of special, a special thing uh, which says that for any other object, call that C, uh, that also has an arrow into A and an, and an arrow into B, there's going to be a unique mapping from C into P. So that's the, the definition of what a product is in a category. Um, so uh, the way this works for, for types, you know, RP is like the product A and B, like that. And then this is uh, second and this is first, or, you know, underscore one and underscore two. Uh, and it's the case that whenever we have anything that contains an A and a B, uh, we can, in a, in a unique and totally canonical way, get the A and B out into a, a product like this. We can just sort of like, well, get the A and a B and put them in a pair. Uh, and then project them out like this. Um, <clears throat> so what this this sort of diagram here is saying that there's actually maybe a whole category of arrows like this. So there's going to be a whole category uh, of of things that are, you know, it's like it's going to be called like I don't know X Y Z and whatever, and all of them are going to have arrows into A and B, okay? They're all going to have arrows into A and B. There are lots of ways that we can get to both an A and a B from lots of different things in here. Um, but this is going to be a category because we can actually construct arrows between these, these sort of, uh, uh, diagrams like this. So we, so we, whenever we have a diagram that looks kind of like that, we can construct an arrow from one of those diagrams to another, which is just going to be an arrow from one of the, from X to Y, and then maybe from Y to Z, and from X to Z or something. So <clears throat> we're going to construct a category where an arrow, be, where the objects are diagrams like this. And then we're going to define the arrows as being arrows, uh, as being constructed on the, on the uh, objects in the center. And that's going to construct an arrow between these diagrams. And then there's going to be some top diagram in this. Uh, oh, sorry. There's going to be a bottom. There's going to be a terminal object in this category, which is going to be this diagram right here. OK? So, so then we've used this notion of a terminal object in a category to talk about like what is a a product, kind of cool. Uh, let's talk about duality. Duality. 
duality is the property that uh, whenever you have a category uh, C, you also have a category which is called C op, which is the opposite category of C, where you just flip all of the arrows in that category. Uh, so, so then an arrow in C op that goes from uh, A to B is actually an arrow in C that goes from B to A. Right, so this is sort of like a, a C op arrow, and this is going to be a C arrow. And those are going to be the same. What's cool about this is that <clears throat> um, whenever we have some cons construction in category theory, in one category, we can flip all the arrows and take the dual of that uh, idea. And we, uh, we end up with another theory that is also true, something that we can also say, but is not the same thing, which is kind of cool. Uh, so for example, if we take this notion of a product uh, and we flip it, uh, so instead of talking about a terminal object in a category like this, we can talk about an initial object in a category like this. And so then we have uh, something, let's call that uh, Q. I need a new marker here. So, so let's say we have some object Q, uh, and there is uh, an arrow into Q from some object B and some object A, okay? Then uh, this is going to be the dual notion of a product. So this is going to be the co-product. We say co as a prefix to mean like the dual thing. Uh, so the co-product of A and B uh, is going to be Q. And it's going to have the property that it is the initial object in a category like this, So, which means that whenever we have any other diagram like this, any other thing that looks like this relationship between, oh, sorry, other way, looks like this relationship between A and B through Q. So we have this thing here. Whenever we have a C like that, there's going to be a unique uh, arrow from Q to C. So I've just in inverted this diagram. All the arrows are now backwards. And this, this is going to be uh, a meaningful thing, category theory promises. And it's not going to be the same thing as that, but it's going to be the dual thing. Uh, so in uh, Haskell or, or Scala, this uh, Q here, it turns out to be either A or B. Cool? Um, so this is going to be uh, left, and this is going to be right. There are two ways of constructing Q. We can say left of an A or right of a B. Um, and then for any other thing that we can construct from either uh, an A or B, we can definitely construct that thing from either A or B because we're going to definitely have either an A or a B. And um, so this is saying that uh, this, this diagram commutes. So all of the, the paths through this diagram are the same. So taking this arrow is the same as first projecting into the coproduct, I mean, sort of uh, injecting into the coproduct, and then going from the coproduct to RC. Cool? Um, let's tackle co-products and co-products in a different category, maybe. So, like, this applies to uh, monoids. Like, if we could take the product of two monoids. We could take the product co-product of two monoids, which is a lot more interesting. But maybe uh, a simpler thing to tackle is posets. Uh, so, if we have a category like a poset, like, what's the product in a poset? Let's do that. All right, so now, waving my hands, we're in a totally different category. Let's say we're, we're now talking about a product in uh, a poset. 
Now remember, a, a post set or a partially ordered set is a category where there's exactly uh, where there's at most one arrow between any two objects. So it's like uh, the uh, 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 the the less than or equal to uh, thing, right? So integers with the uh, with the less than or equal to uh, as the as the arrows, and then composition being the transitivity of this. Cool. So what's a product in a category like that? Let's let's think about that. Um, so a product is going to be something that has uh, an whenever there's an arrow from that to A and, and B, uh, then for every other thing that has an arrow into A and B, there's going to be a unique arrow from it to, to this one. Okay, so an arrow like this is going to be a relationship like this. So this is saying like P is uh, less than or equal to A. That's what that's saying. It's also saying that P is less than or equal to B. Uh, and it's saying that uh, P is an object such that, whenever this is the case, then for every other uh, C, which also is both uh, like this, uh, then uh, C is going to be less than P, less than or equal to P, right? Then uh, you know, all that implies that C is going to be less than or equal to P. Okay? So, so what is that saying? Well, it's saying that P is going to be larger than every C that is smaller than, than both A and B. So it's going to be the largest uh, it's going to be the, the greatest lower bound of these two things. All right, so the product in a post set is the greatest lower bound. Pretty cool. And then, as if by magic, we can flip all the arrows and get the coproduct, which is going to be the least upper bound. Um, and we don't even, you know, we can just you know, dust off our hands and, and say we're done, because that it follows from duality, right? It's kind of cool. Uh, okay. Is there anything else that we want to say about categories? Let, okay, can we map this to the real world? Uh, like where category theory helped, uh, helped us with some programming. I mean, like monoids are an example of like a thing that comes up all the time in programming and that I find like super helpful and useful. Um, but like where this stuff comes in handy, um, I mean, that's not really why we're here, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Oh, so they use category theory to make code more readable in Clojure? Oh, in the CATS library, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, this kind of stuff comes up all the time in in, uh, uh, in programming. I mean, like monads, for instance, come up come up all the time. We haven't talked about what monads are uh, cate categorically. Uh, I guess we could do that, talk about monads. Um, yeah, let's talk about monads. I'm not going to hate on monads in this. OK, so monads. Um, how, how are we going to approach monads? Let's approach monads through Lysley category. OK. Here's what we're going to construct. We're going to construct a Kleisley category. Kleisley category for a functor uh, F. Okay. 
So we're gonna we're gonna make uh, we're gonna uh, talk about the, this notion of a of a classic error. So it, so it's a category. Um, so given another category, I want to say another category called the underlying category. I call that the category C. That's you know this is going to be like Scala or Haskell or something. Um, <clears throat> then we we are going to have an endo functor, an endo functor f that goes from C to C. Uh, and we're going to construct the category in the following way. The objects uh, are going to just be objects in C. So in C. And the, but the arrows are going to be cool. The arrows are such that we're going to have uh, an arrow uh, from A to B in our Kleise category is going to be uh, is going to be an arrow from A to F of B in C. Okay. And I'm going to say that uh, there's going to be a composition uh, or that we're going to require that there's some composition so it's that if we have another arrow G uh, that goes from B to C, then we necessarily have a composite arrow, uh, you know, G compose F that goes from A to C. And that is going to be an arrow from A to F of C in C, in the category C. Okay? <clears throat> so for example, uh, I guess we could take option as, as our functor. Uh, so we're going to consider a category uh, for the endo functor option, um, where the underlying category is uh, the Scala category, the objects are types, and we're going to say that uh, an arrow from A to B in our category is going to be a function from uh, A to option. Option is maybe option B. Okay? And the composition is not going to be function composition because that's not going to work. Because we ha if we have another uh, function that goes from B to option C, Right? Uh, we're, we can't compose these because these types are not compatible. We can't say this is F, F and this is G. We can't compose these. But we can invent a composition that's going to be a, this composition in our Kleisley category. And, and it's going to do this for us. And the way we're going to implement that is uh, the composition, uh, we're going to define that as this sort of fish thing. Composition of F and G is going to be uh, it's going to be uh, F compose. Now let's let's do it in a sort of pointful way. Uh, it's going to be like a lambda of x, which goes to F of x dot flat map. Of G. This is going to be our fun our composition on these arrows, and so where each one of these uh, functions is an arrow in this Kleisley category. Cool. This is a Kleisley arrow from A to B, a Kleisley arrow from B to C, uh, and the composition involves flat map in Haskell. It is called bind, like that. Uh, and whenever we have a classic category like this, or some functor, uh, we have a monad. That's what a monad is. Uh, there are there are other ways of of getting to monads. Like we can talk about like we had the category of endo functors, and we can talk about monoids in the category of endo functors. Uh, and those turns out turn out to be monads. Cool. Uh, what else? So and, and you know this is super useful for 
programming uh, because like uh, it, it is very useful to know that whenever we have two functions that might fail, we can compose them and have them fail in a canonical way if either one of them fails. Uh, so the first the first one to fail will just you know cause the whole thing to fail. Uh, and it's going to be a category, so this composition is going to be associative. And that actually has an, an interesting uh, uh, property, like like the associativity rule of the monad is actually useful uh, when we're writing code. So we can say things like, Uh, if we have like for this this in Haskell this is do uh, for and we have like x comes from foo and then y comes from bar and z comes from baz and then we like yield I don't know uh, f of x y and z like this. Um, let's say that bar is actually for, you know, A comes from Cooks and B comes from Cooks or something and we yield something else. Like let's say that this is a whole other sort of for comprehension like or do, do notation program. Um, we want to be able to say that we can take this definition uh, and we can inline it here. Right? It should it should be it should work that we should be able to say A comes from you know Cooks and like B comes from the other thing and then uh, uh, you know uh, Y uh, is equal to whatever we did here. This is like G of AB or something. G of AB. Right? You should be able to just like insert that in here. Uh, and that's the associativity rule for, uh, for monad. So that's the associativity rule for the Klesi category, for the composition in the Klesi category. All right? It's because uh, four is actually, you know, calls to flat map and map. So this is actually, you know, foo dot flat map. So just syntax sugar for foo dot flat map something, and then cooks. You know, there's like x in here, uh, and then the you know cooks dot flat map, and so on. It's a long chain of flat maps like this, and it's it's sort of associated associated in in here, uh, and then at some point we're calling bar in here and then we want to take the whole the whole sort of flat map chain and inline it we want to be able to take the parentheses that were uh, were around this this flat map chain and sort of reassociate the whole thing so that it falls into this flat map chain right so essentially uh, move all of the, the parentheses over to the to the right uh, and the, and uh, the associativity rule for for uh, Claisley composition or composition in the Claisley category is what makes the, makes that possible. It would be super surprising if this didn't work. Like if we couldn't do a program transformation like this. Uh, I mean, if it like did something totally different, depending on whether we have subroutines, like that would be crazy. Uh, so yeah, so now we've gotten to something that's useful in programming. Great, awesome. Uh, anything else that we want to talk about? Question? Oh uh, yeah, I mean it's true that there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, vocabulary here. Uh, it's 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 like a whole language that that you're learning, but it's really more like a library that. You know, it's like whenever you're learning to use a new library, you have to learn the names of all the functions in the library and all the types in the library. And there's a sort of lingo uh, with, you know, among the people who use that library. Right. But, but the thing is that if we use the category theory names, 
the, the, our circle of friends that we can have a common vocabulary with uh, goes back decades, uh, and sometimes centuries or thousands of years. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, there are lots of people who tried to make this sort of more approachable to, uh, to people by like, yeah. You know, I'm actually working on a programming language that uh, is just called Unison, where you can have as many names for a thing as you want. Um, we, we, can, we can check that. I'll, I'll advertise that right here. You can check that out. It's on, it's on unisonweb.org. Um, still in development, but maybe check that out. Uh, anything else we want to talk about? Yeah. I don't want. I don't want to do that now. Uh, yeah. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Uh, language designers use category theory to. Uh, I'll just repeat what you said. Language designers often use category theory in order to reason about the correctness of their their uh, programming language, like whether they have bugs. Uh, and I mean, often I think that you can discover ways of doing things in a programming language design that you may, may not have thought of. Um, you know, like, uh, if, you, if, there's, if you're designing a module system, for instance, like you might want the property that, um, that you have a category of modules. Like, it doesn't matter, you know, which two modules you mix in first. Like, n none of them has sort of like a, per like the, the first thing, like for instance in, uh, oh, this is actually an interesting example. Like in Scala, if you say, uh, you know, x with y with z, this with thing is it doesn't form a category. It's not a, a composition uh, in, in like a category because x is special. X is sort of like the, like this is like sort of like the head type. But it might be interesting to think about what a Scala I mean, it would be interesting to think about for a designer of a language what, what a Scala would look like if uh, it didn't matter which one of these uh, came first. And it, it, like, in fact, if you could consider, uh, you know, Y with Z as being, you know, an honest goodness type, and then you could say, like, X with, with that, and that would be the same as X with Y with Z, right? But it's actually not the case. So that's an example. Oh, sorry, what? Oh, yeah, Ed, Ed Kmet just gave a, um, a talk on, on inverse semigroups where he was balancing parentheses. Yeah, I mean, that's another example of this coming into. That's an excellent point. Yeah, so he, he gave this talk about um, balancing parentheses or, or figuring out whether parentheses are balanced uh, using, uh, well, essentially using a, a category theory notion, uh, an, an inverse semigroup. Uh, and you make the point that he may have come to this elegant solution because he was well versed in category theory. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I suspect that's the case because, like, I know I would come up with some kind of ad hoc mess that like didn't make any sense. But like, yeah. Um. So, oh, limits, right? Limits and co-limits. All right. That's a really great example. Just for the people on the on the interwebs, uh, Derek points out that uh, a module. What would you say? Like an M, in an ML module system, like the, the module that imports is a co-limit, an example of a co-limit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. A module that imports two other modules would be a pushout. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Which is another uh, another category three notion. 
so yeah, lots of lots of cool applications of this, uh, and like it gives you access to lots of mathematics and fun things to play with. Uh, so yeah, uh, everybody is now a category theorist, right? Uh, I mean, at least like I hope you know pe people at least have have the the idea of like what a category theory, uh, what a category is, and lots of examples of categories, and maybe we'll be able to recognize categories uh, when you see them. Uh, so. Thank you all for coming. That's uh, all I have.